In 1968, both the United States and the Russians were engaged in the space race, and the Soviets had a big edge. The U.S. needed its best soldiers and scientists for this battle. In Frank Borman, they had both. He was an Air Force fighter pilot who had a master's in aeronautical engineering. In short, the perfect candidate for America's astronaut program. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't interested in walking on the moon or picking up rocks. I didn't join because I'm an explorer or an adventurer. My view is it was a serious operation akin to combat, and uh, I was there for that reason. By 1968, NASA had fallen behind schedule, and all flights were grounded after a fatal fire killed three astronauts. Meanwhile, the Soviets had plans to send men around the moon by the end of the year. America had to act and act fast. And so in the course of one afternoon, NASA outlined the basic parameters of Apollo 8. Frank Borman was named commander. Astronauts Jim Lovell and Bill Anders rounded out the crew. The date was set, liftoff on December 21st, 1968, giving everyone only a few weeks to train for NASA's riskiest mission. Everybody was determined to win and they were all motivated. As a matter of fact, I think it was the greatest team this country's ever produced since World War II. Apollo 8 was scheduled to reach the moon on December 24th. If they failed, Christmas would be ruined. So on December 20th at around T minus 12 hours until liftoff, Frank Borman knelt down by his bedside to pray. Well, I prayed, of course, the Lord's Prayer as I've done every night of my life as long as I can remember. But I also prayed that uh, basically that the crew would do a good job that because I didn't want to, I didn't want our, we hadn't had a lot of time to train and I, I didn't want anybody to make a mistake that would endanger the mission. After a sleepless night, Frank and his fellow astronauts boarded the massive Saturn V rocket. And with three brave men, 36 stories in the air, the world was watching the final countdown to a mission that few believed would even get off the ground. We're going through a checklist, listening to the ground. 15, 14. You're totally focused on your, on your job. 13, 12. And uh, it was uh, it's just business. 11, 10, 9. Look, I'd like to say that we did some heroic job and we saved them. Actually, everything worked well. At 7.51 AM, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. For the first time in history, four, three, man was headed to the moon. One, zero. We have commit. We have liftoff at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I don't think our G's got up more than about five and a half or six. All in all, the Saturn was a, was a wonderful ride. Within a few minutes after liftoff, the Apollo 8 crew had gone higher than anyone had ever gone before. And, you know, from standing on the ground, 11 minutes later, you're in orbit. This one is smoother. By the 55-hour marker of the flight, Apollo 8 started to be reeled in by the moon's gravity. The crew was now falling upwards towards the lunar surface and the most harrowing part of their mission. You entered the lunar orbit when you were behind the moon. So there was no communication with the Earth. Before loss of signal, NASA passed on a message from Frank's wife, who wanted him to know the custard's in the oven at 350. Susan and I had always kidded about that, you know, you got to do the custard and I'll do the flying. And she wanted to re reassure me that uh, everything was home, at home was okay. Thanks a lot, Trip. We'll see you on the other side. As Susan waited by the squawk box, the crew was 240,000 miles away. There, alone and upside down, the astronauts became the first men to ever lay eyes on the barren landscape of the far side of the moon. The time, a few minutes before 5 a.m. on December 24th, Christmas Eve. We looked down and the lunar surface was uh, just different shades of gray and black and white. Looks like a sand pile my kids have been playing in for a long time. Shortly after spotting the moon, the crew executed a burn to make sure they weren't going too fast or too slow for lunar orbit. 
And a half hour later, Mission Control regained contact with the ship. For hours upon hours, the astronauts photographed the arid terrain to scout out potential landing sites for future missions. On the fourth pass around the moon, across the arc of the lunar horizon, Bill Anders spotted something that changed the world. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. And we looked up, and there in the background was the, the only object in the entire universe that had any color. Wow, is that pretty? And here we are a long way from home, and this beautiful blue marble is floating back there 240,000 miles away. You got a crazy very clear right here. You gotta remember, this was the Christmas season. I'm, I can't again speak for how Jim and Bill felt, but I was uh, nostalgic. I miss my family. Take your civil, good civil up here. Let me just get the right setting here. Okay, calm down, Bubba. At that moment, Anders captured a photo that has since been called Earthrise. Time magazine later said in a war torn year, it captured the beauty and fragility of our home planet. Back at home, families were gathered around to celebrate Christmas Eve and watch Apollo's progress. It's estimated that a billion people were tuned into Apollo 8's Christmas Eve broadcast. And to the largest audience in human history, the astronauts had a message for all mankind. How about now, uh, Apollo? Loud and clear. When we were told that we'd have the largest time, the Jim and Bill and I tried to focus on what was appropriate. And we came up with all kinds of things. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is awe-inspiring. Some of them kind of silly about Christmas and so on. And it was very difficult. It makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. So I asked a friend of mine, and he couldn't come up with anything. Apollo 8, uh, we've apparently lost your voice. The picture is no good. So we had a friend that he trusted. He spent one whole night and had nothing but crumpled up note paper. He couldn't figure out anything either. And it was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock. His wife came walking down the stairs and said, Joe, what in the world are you doing? She, he said, explain what you're doing. And she said, well, why don't you just start in the beginning? And uh, he said, what do you mean? He said, Genesis. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. As soon as it was suggested to us, all three of us said, why didn't we think of that? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The crew read from the book of Genesis, 10 verses, straight from the creation story. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I think we were trying to convey the fact that it wasn't just all happenstance, that there was a power behind the, the world and behind, our, behind life that gave it meaning. And God called the white day. And the darkness he called night, and the evening, and the morning when the first day. It was a very rewarding feeling for me that uh, here we were in a country that uh, that felt that way. And God called the dry land Earth. Now, can you imagine that happening today? Or can you imagine if that had been a Russian up there? And we'd have heard about Lenin and Stalin and communists. And all they told us was to do something appropriate. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Christmas Day arrived a few hours later, and with it, time to come home. As the astronauts reflected on the holiday at the moon, Anders deadpanned he hoped he wouldn't be spending New Year's there as well. The concern was real. If the engines failed to fire, the crew would be stuck in lunar orbit forever. Meanwhile, Susan Borman began writing her husband's eulogy. And as she sat at her kitchen table, the Apollo 8 crew was in radio silence. Apollo 8, Houston. Finally, at 12.25 a.m., Christmas morning, Jim Lovell's voice crackled through the speakers. Apollo 8, over. Hello, Apollo 8. Loud and clear. We got the confirmation that we were, we were on a perfect trajectory. Uh, it was one of uh, great satisfaction. Roger. Please be informed there is a Santa Claus. 
And at long last, Apollo 8 crew was on its way home. A final quarter million miles to conclude history's longest holiday trip. And before long, to the garbled tune of Oh Holy Night, the sleepy crew was getting ready for re-entry. Back at home in the Borman household, presents would have to wait. Susan refused to open anything until she could do so with her husband. Instead, she took her boys to church. There, the reverend prayed for the benefit of one member of the congregation, that the God of time and space watch over her and protect the astronauts of our country. Thousands upon thousands of miles away, Apollo 8 picked up speed. Soon they were racing back home 10 times faster than a bullet fired from a rifle. On the morning of December 27th, the crew was given the go for re-entry. First place, you had to uh, relieve an, an enormous thermal load on the spacecraft. That meant jetting the service module. Now all that was left of the Titanic Saturn V rocket was a 10-foot cone. And you come into the, the atmosphere uh, at a very shallow but a the definite down angle. This angle had to be precise. Too shallow and the crew would skip off the Earth. Too steep and they'd be incinerated. Like many other parts of this mission, this had never been done before. As a matter of fact, I don't think it had really had a successful uh, or, or a complete test of that even unmanned. But again, it worked perfectly. While the Earth's atmosphere would slow the ship down, there was a trade-off. It would generate heat. Just outside the spacecraft, a few feet from the astronauts' faces, temperatures rose to 5,000 degrees, half that of the surface of the sun. With the added heat came added pressure. In this case, six times the weight of gravity. When you take those kind of Gs, your eyes flatten out, so you get tunnel vision, you know, looking like this. Uh, it's hard to breathe. It feels like you have an elephant sitting on your chest. Hang on. But when you pull six Gs for six minutes, it becomes a little more interesting. <laughs> so uh, toward the end of the, of the six minutes, uh, I think we were all huffing and puffing. At this point, the entire ship was like a manned comet. One Pan Am pilot saw the craft and estimated its fiery tail to be 100 miles long. At 40,000 feet, the astronauts were hurtling to the Pacific at 680 miles an hour. And NASA could only hope the crew was on the right trajectory. Ken Mattingly just put in a call and he's gotten no responses yet. Finally, Houston, Apollo 8, over. a parachute deployed, then another and the ship softly glided down to the ocean. At exactly 4.51 a.m. local on December 27th, right on its scheduled time and location, the ship splashed down into the ocean. 147 hours after blastoff, the Apollo 8 crew was back home. I'd like to tell you that it, well, I flew it perfectly because I am the world, I was the world's best, I may still be the world's best pilot, but nevertheless, it was all on the autopilot. Aboard the USS Yorktown, the three astronauts received a hero's welcome. It felt wonderful. We'd done the job. We were back on Earth. I was going to see my family in a few hours. I mean, it's a high point of, the, of your life, really. The Apollo 8 journey proved man could make it to the moon. And minutes after arriving home, Frank Borman, who joined NASA to help America fight the Cold War, was getting congratulated by the President of the United States. I was extremely proud of the fact that we had done our job and the mission was successful, and we beat the Russian. For their part, the Russians never reached the moon. And after their defeat in the space race, they stopped trying. The Soviets said they hoped Apollo 8 would open the door to more cooperation between them and the United States. That dream came true. And even today, Russian cosmonauts and Americans work side by side. I think we contributed to winning the Cold War. I think that was the, uh, an important factor in winning the Cold War. The reading of Genesis would go down in lore. The Pope himself later remarked, in that moment, the world had peace. I think that had more impact than anything else. The following July. It's one small step for man. Neil Armstrong took mankind's first steps on the lunar surface. One giant leap for mankind. 
He did so in the Sea of Tranquility, an area Bill Anders photographed as a potential landing site on Apollo 8. With his Cold War complete, Frank Borman went on to be the CEO of Eastern Airlines before retiring to a ranch in Montana. Still, the Apollo 8 mission is fresh on his mind. It was a wonderful demonstration of what this country can do when it finally pulls together in one direction. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth.